based on vocabularies. Yes. Were there any differences between the speakers of different languages? So as second language. So no, that's different. So we tested uh, our participants' vocabulary speaks only in one uh, language or dialect in standard OED. And for language provision, for vocabulary provision, yes, we, we did find uh, evidence for differences between the three groups. So the multilinguals have a lower vocabulary in standard OED than uh, by dialectal and monolingual participants. No, I mean, uh, the multilingual speakers were speakers of uh, Greek and one another language. Yes. Between these one another languages, I mm -hmm. mean, were there any differences? Uh, we didn't test for the vocabulary skills in the other language besides Greek. Besides mm -hmm. Greek. So, yeah, I can answer that question. <laughs> you don't have the power to do that. <laughs> no. How many languages do you have? Uh, I don't have a number, but that was very steep in language and mm -hmm. uh, kind of other languages, two three languages mostly. I don't have a number on any other languages. Can you say something about what ironic intonation was like for, um, uh, it was standard Greek, right? Yeah. What you, uh, that was one of your conditions was that there was ironic causes of ironic intonation. I'm just curious to know um, what were the characteristics? Yeah, so we just asked our actors, so this uh, video is uh, recorded from professional actors, to just ask them to record the items with an ironic intonation and an ironic facial expression. But then we looked, uh, afterwards I looked at the uh, acoustic characteristics of the um, uh, ironic items. And what we found was that the ironic items had uh, a higher mean intensity than the literal items. So a higher louder. mean intensity? Yeah, they were what? louder basically. They, they were louder. louder. Yeah, and there were also differences in the um, first syllable, in that the first syllable was uh, longer than uh, in the ironic items compared to the literal items. Can I just do a quick follow-up? Uh, oh, oh, sorry, it's okay. okay. And you also ask an independent sample of participants to rate the all items in terms of how sincere or ironic uh, they found them for both facial expression and intonation. And we found again that the ironic items were rated as more ironic than um, uh, the But if they weren't perfect, then why should people think it's ironic? If I mean, unless unless your uh, your your prosody and your facial expressions are in fact accurate for irony, I mean, you only got fifty percent accuracy. I mean, that's telling you that a bunch of people saw that and still didn't think it was accurate. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you do with something that's that people don't believe is ironic? I think there was a distinction there between some people putting more emphasis on the semantics of the items <coughs> and some other people putting more emphasis on the intonation and the yeah, still should not have you 50 percent, should give you 100 percent. Yeah, uh, but so no wonder things were slower for the irony if people didn't recognize it as irony or didn't know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, just a follow up. I like that happens in real life, pretty relatively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe it's back. That's a property of irony. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much it's slower, it's less accurate. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we also found this, this effect of inhibition, which kind of, of inhibition skills, which kind of suggests, again, that uh, those people who interpreted or actually understood the irony, uh, they kind of initially process the some semantic features of uh, the target statement. So it was not only that ironic integration took longer to process, we also found this yes. of inhibition, which yes, so part of very series of kind of suggests that again iron is a fourth point. Okay, so just, 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 just a quick yeah, quick clarification question. So did you have the same sentences for both like the literal uh, condition. So the little condition, which is the like no, uh, like minus facial expression, minus intonation, yes. and minus context. Yes. I see. Okay. Uh, no, we actually manipulated the uh, cues for the literal meanings, uh, for the literal conditions as well, but only for the ironic conditions. Okay. 
And how, how we should do that with the manipulations? So in the positive, uh, in the literal positive uh, condition, for example, they look more enthusiastic than they are, or they look like, for instance, in terms of the donation. Okay. And those were like requests um, for the actor, um, like sort of like the naive actor um, who was just like asked to portray that. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Just, yeah. Okay. so these were over years. <clears throat> Yeah. 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 Susan, sorry, you were, you had a question. So, I, thought, I think that that's a very elegant study because of all of the internal relationships you found that were completely sensible and predictable, um, that people, you are actually getting at um, the perception of irony, even if it, they aren't perfect stimuli. Um, but, I lost track of what the main conclusion was. So, so, so the 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 prediction was that the bilinguals would be better at irony because they're better pragmatics and they're they're better at perspective taking and all kinds of things that 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 having to switch between two languages would make you better at, but they weren't. Um, um, which. Um, and then the conclusion was they're as good as monolinguals, but as if That's the well, but why not just say they're equal to monolinguals as opposed to they're as good as mono? Because you already found that you had two, you had two, you had the bilingual, the bi bidialectical ones and the bilingual ones, and and the vocabulary deficit was only with the bidialectical ones, but there was no effect of that whatsoever. So, so I don't think that you, you get a you get a, um, a a boost for your hypothesis by saying they're at least they've overcome a deficit relative to my monolinguals because there's no evidence for any deficit, you know, any mono, any difference between the monolinguals and the bilinguals at all. In, in the study, which I think is a really interesting finding, and I see why you made the prediction you you did, but so how do you, but what do you think? So what's your takeaway from that? So basically, we did find a difference between multilinguals and monolinguals in terms of the vocabulary skills. So in what? Uh, in the vocabulary. Yes, vocabulary but not skills. between them and the bidialectals. Yes. And so. Uh, no. So, no. Between by dialectals as well. So multilinguals have a lower vocabulary than both by dialectals and monolinguals. Okay. Oh, they, oh I, I, I forgot. I, I, I misremembered that result. Okay. Yeah. And uh, okay. so. Well, I'm I sure you know the result. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I said that bilinguals have monolingual like pragmatic performance mm -hmm. uh, because some accounts would predict that. First, at lower stages of language proficiency or at lower stages of language learning, uh, they might not be so good in terms of their phonetics. So, or maybe that's all they have. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So they're working. They're yeah. They're working off of the semantic. I mean, they're working off the physical things that you gave them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's the monolinguals are almost as, or at, as good as, they're almost as good as the bilinguals, mm -hmm. you could say. I see, yeah. So, okay, so you, you're taking there to be two countervening um, uh, influences in the study which are canceling each other out, which is why you stated that. Not in this study, I wouldn't say so, because yeah. in this study we did not, not find an effect of vocabulary, and we also found that all participants were well, at ceiling with in terms of their in terms of the literal conditions. But some people would say that in another study where uh, with bilinguals but a much lower language which is other bilinguals we can say that those bilinguals might perform worse than uh, the monolinguals yeah. because they don't have enough of the semantics that are required to actually understand whatever literal meaning has to be processed before understanding the language. So and it was Yes. Um, I have a question for Sammy. Um, and I was wondering, in trying to assess whether two or three-year-olds um, understand um, various blasphemous terms, 
uh, one thing I suppose you could do is uh, take have a picture of array of all sorts of things that would count as a cap for an adult, or all sorts of things that would could be called water, or, or you know, and then get children to identify, you know, find all the caps, find all the water, find all the whatever it is, and see uh, how much variation there is in a trio. My guess is there's a lot that some some will know quite a few. They might know that pens have caps. Um, and they might not. Um, they're probably not going to treat lids with cats. Um, and the, the question is, you know, what, how much this relates to the exposure they've had from uh, parents in terms of what different things are called in the, in the household, because I think there's probably a fair amount of variation also in some of these things. Yeah, um, we did get uh, data, for, I, I really like that idea. Um, we did get data from parents in this study, and uh, they simply rated on a, like a Likert scale how common is it in your household to refer to this item as a cap, mm -hmm. and the um, other item. Um, and I think it was like 76% of parents uh, reported, reported that their child heard both of those labels um, at least more than sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, which is like, yes. I mean, I'm not sure I believe, entirely believe their ability to gauge that. And not because I don't believe the parent report, but because I think people are really bad at telling you how many yes. meanings they know Absolutely. for a word. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so, but I guess in that case, we sort of avoid that to some extent by giving them the picture and saying, this is the meaning we're talking about. Do you yeah. call this a cap? Um, but uh, yeah, I love the idea. Um, yeah, I wonder, uh, also, I think children, it'd be interesting to see whether they're motivated to be very, very correct or completely correct, right? Or whether they sort of have this belief that, like, many adults do as, as well, that, like, there's an essence or there's a meaning or a definition for words. Well, in which could, case they would... you could give them different arrays. Well, maybe there's only one actual target versus where there are three or four and see for individual children how, how much they, they are accurate on the one versus the four, um, or whether they're just going on the board and trying to pick every picture in sight, which you might get with two-year-olds. <laughs> okay. um, I wanted to ask about the question for the Greek study again. So I was just thinking about um, whether you might expect um, differences to emerge um, for um, rating or, or detecting irony, if you if you had tested people um, whose di linguistic differences also went along with maybe larger um, cultural differences, then I'm I'm guessing there was a maybe degree of cultural overlap or homogeneity among the populations that you tested. Also, they were in were they tested in the same region where they all residents of the same region. Yeah, so, right. So I mean especially I think in, in terms of your um, hypothesis about whether there was an advantage due to um, um, a greater ability to switch or pivot that if there's actually a common pragmatic stratum that's coming from some shared cultural background and uh, this is not my area, I'm just sort of musing along these lines and wondering if you still might see the differences you expected had you sampled populations that were culturally and, and, and more different. Yeah, but then that would make it an ethical culture, or an ethical bilingual, I would say. If you don't find it for bilingual speakers who mm -hmm. yeah. using their well, language, just, mm -hmm. then just find it for... Uh, mm -hmm. so, so we kind of manipulated language similarity in yeah. our study, because the dialectal speakers spoke two dialects, which are very similar, and then the bilingual speakers spoke kind of different language. So now we see that is not harm effect mm -hmm. on our results. Which means that if we look from Tamil, I mean with uh, bilingual speakers of Greek and Chinese mm -hmm. and found the effect, then maybe the effect is not due to bilingual, but it's due to cultural differences, cultural differences. Well, the question is whether there was anything they needed to inhibit in the task. Mm -hmm. If they weren't if the whatever substrate serves the detection of irony, if that was actually the same functioning, giving the same response in, in their, both of their, their languages. And, um, mm -hmm. So 
a hard question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the toddler study. Uh, I was just, when I see the logic behind counting objects um, that in Spanish um, were similar to the objects that you were using in English, mm -hmm. but I was just wondering what you think counts as a similar meaning. Like it seems like there's so many dimensions along which something could be similar. And I know you said you measured for shape and texture and another another category, but um, you know there's also like size and dimension and weight and all those other things. Like what what do you think counts as a similar meaning and how would how how did you approach that when you were designing the study? Um. So yeah, for that that last study that I have had data on. Yeah, um, so uh, we did get um, norming data. Um, so we had um, 65 objects, or 64 objects and 32 pairs that we thought were similar. And then we we did the full factorial of that, which is 2,000 comparisons for people to get. So we wanted to know, we wanted to validate that people believed it was similar. Um, if you're asking like a theoretical question, um, I mean, yeah, I think that's like a billion dollar question of like what is sort of what is similarity. Um, I think one thing that I'm doing now is I'm actually um, making objects uh, uh, like parametrically varied objects using like a script. So um, then. I can, so like you might have like novel objects that have like a bunch of points and you can vary how pointy they are versus how flat. Um, and that's nice because then the computer gives you the parameters of that and you don't have to, you know, mess with like get 2,000 measurements from people. <laughs> um, uh, that's not really an answer I think, to the theoretical question though. I mean, I think, yeah, like this has been a important question since like the 50s and 60s and we have a million different ways of measuring similarity. I mean. Culturally, we know that different dimensions matter to different extents, mm -hmm. right? So maybe, I don't know about size, that's an interesting one to think about. I, I think it's probably not that true in English. Um, we probably wouldn't extend a label based off of a size, um, although, although we might. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that I think that all of the extension patterns have to be learned. Like even our propensity to have shape be this dimension we really care about, that is something that looks like it's learned uh, by children, like 17 month olds, as they learn more nouns, then they learn this productive shape rule. Um, so, yes, I'm not sure if I'm going to that. That is my question. Thank you. So, so, so yeah. what, what are the linguistic distinctions between polysemy? homophony, vagueness. I mean, it's, it's not it's so, so, bat is not polysemous when you're talking about the baseball bat and the animal. Right? So, so, and surely shoe is not polysemous, even though it encompasses this one and that one, right? So, so, so you, you, you've picked out something that you think in the, that's in the middle of those. But what is it? Right? Um, because if it's, if it's, in, in fact, I, I take your your results as more about vagueness. You know, I mean, you did not expect them to do that generalization. But that generalization is exactly what you should expect is if they have a concept like shoe, right? For cat, right? Um, and. We do call things that don't look like those shoes, like on a horse's foot, right? Because so there's functional features, there's all kinds of features that that enter. You know, we we make so many more conceptual distinctions and perceptual distinctions than we have language for. So it's a real it, it's a real you know, mess. But anyway, so what do you mean by you know? Do you have is there a test for policing? Um, there is. Um, I am not I am not proposing it or championing it because it's received a lot of uh, debate, <laughs> but there is. So um, you can count them as separate separate representations and separate concepts if they're not interchangeable in a conjunctive statement. So, um, like uh, if I said. Um, 
Sally brought a pike to the party, and so did I. And I meant a pike that you would hold and a fish, and a pike that you would hold in the first and a fish in the second. And um, that would be very infelicitous for me to s say that. Um, so that's that's the test. Um, that well, that's the test that distinguishes it from homophony, yeah. but not the test that distinguishes it from a single day processing. Oh, so that test is supposed to pick up both polysemy and homophony. It's supposed to pick up any case where the representations should be are are likely to be distinct, even if they are have some relationship between them, right? Because you can't do that with homonymy, and you also <laughs> you're, it's also considered infelicitous by participants to do that with Felicity, right? So if I put a bottle cap on my head and someone else is wearing a, a bottle cap, it would be weird for someone to say, like, they're wearing a cap and so am I, unless they were joking, right? Um, so I think, yeah, so I think that picks up on this idea that there, there have to be distinct representations at some point. Um, I actually don't, I don't have a problem with the fact that, it's, like, the more shoes we learn about, the more distinct representations we may have for them, right? So someone who sells shoes for a living might think it's laughable to call a boot and a sneaker a shoe, right? They might actually say, like, that's a, you know, whatever you call them. I don't know. Um, and so uh, I, I think, I, I just don't think there's a necessarily that clear of a distinction. And I think the sooner that word learning theory is allowed for kind of the both levels of abstraction, both like multiple distinct exemplars and then sort of vague generalizations that you can make inferences about, then that'll really start to look like what kids can do. Because I agree, I think that our results in the novel extensions case are evidence for using inference based on vague representations, but they also show evidence of having <coughs> stored those, bless you, of having stored those distinct yeah, representations. Right. So I think both of those things have to be have to be happening. Otherwise, like otherwise, we would never create new polisness meanings, right? And we do all the time, right? With slang, especially. Um, I can never think of any, but yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, you. Um, and just a clarification, following up on, on Jennifer's question uh, before. So yes, the. It's not a, a cultural, but you, I, I think I missed the, uh, whether you, um, how the, your subjects came out in the AQ measurement mm -hmm. that you took. And were all of them equally at the same level? Do, you know, were there any differences? Were there no, any differences? In terms of the three groups. Yeah, uh, between groups. No, 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 no difference in terms of the, yeah. in terms of the autistic traits. Yeah, that's, and, and so yeah, and, uh, were there uh, you know, differences uh, between within uh, the groups, like you know, that was uh, there was no effect of artistic traits on iron comprehension. That's, well, that's but within the groups, within the groups. Uh, within the groups. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't yeah. checked that. But was there variance on the measure? Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember the. I mean, if there was no, if, if, if there was no variance, there couldn't have been any effect of it. There, there was no variability. I can't remember the surprise. I mean, that was yeah. That's a measure that's really true. Really, just yeah. you take an ordinary population. And oh yeah, this is exactly yeah. for uh, you know autistic traits in autistic population. Yeah. 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 Yeah
And depending on which of those I give you, it's ironic or not ironic. And so the, the question is you literally cannot know whether I'm being ironic until the very last sentence, that or the very last word. Mm -hmm. Now that takes some computation and presumably, um, given that I start out with a presupposition in most cases that, that the sentence that I'm producing is going to be ordinary, almost all sentences are ordinary, they are not ironic, then the surprise is that it's ironic. And so why shouldn't irony be slower just, <clears throat> sorry, just for that reason? I mean, really, really simple-minded reason. I expect things to be true and straightforward unless they're produced by the President of the U.S. Um, <laughs> uh, whereas in this case, you can't even know that I'm being ironic until the very last word. I could even make it the last syllable of the uh, effortful versus effortless. And, uh, I mean, you can, you can make these things up. So, so my question is, why, why um, I mean, it should, it should depend on the process of actually of understanding the sentence in situ to, to take up a, a line that I've used before. And you can't know until the last word or... Yeah, yeah but that, that logic suggests that every time you, uh, you hear my own cut points, the first kind of process the difference. Right. Sorry. Yeah. The first time well, no. You're the you're, the you're, the you're understanding the literal true. meaning all the way through until you get to that last word. In this case, I mean everything is literal until you get to the very last word, and that's the only part that's not that's not true. It's it's literal. I mean I know what terrific and terrible mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing that we do now is that which I answer your question is that. Uh, we record the reaction time from the time that uh, the final word was heard, basically. So that means whatever difference in between the two conditions were after they get the last right, word. Right. And why would you that think it should, should be there as opposed to earlier? I mean, uh, so some sentences, the ironic part will be right at the beginning or right in the middle. Because that kind of suggests that after you hear the last word, you have all the information, need, whatever. Yeah, whatever. yeah. you have all the information, you still need more time to process their own equations as compared to you. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a kind of theory of understanding that I don't agree with. I, I just find that a, not a sense of it. So the, the notion that you wait until the end of the sentence to, to decide whether you understand it or not, I mean, that's um, not the usual case. I mean, I'm making this computation all the way through. I mean, momentarily. I mean, that's the whole uh, work by Tannhaus just shows this again and again, and other people. So I, you should worry about uh, where you take the measurements and how you take the measurements, I guess. Thank you. Thank you.